This podcast is intended for investment professionals only. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a really exciting time for Elgin in the ESG and responsible investment space of late. As you will remember, the active ownership report was published at the end of April. Today's session is also about the ways in which we take action, um, and we'll come on to that now. So um, I'm joined today by a wonderful selection of members of Elgin's investment stewardship team, Anna, Christy and Stephen, uh, to talk about what has become one of Elgin's best known net zero initiatives, the Climate Impact Pledge. Stephen, maybe we could start with you. For the uninitiated, what is Elgin's Climate Impact Pledge? Elgin encourages companies to tackle climate change and transition to a low carbon economy. An important way we do this is through the Climate Impact Pledge. Um, Climate change, of course, is an issue that uh, affects us all. It's critical to our clients' portfolios and it poses a systemic risk. And the actions through the Climate Impact Pledge and the other engagements that we do designed to uh, mitigate that risk uh, and chart us towards that sort of net zero world. So with the Climate Impact Pledge, we assess over 5,000 companies and we're engaging directly with over 100. We are working to help reduce this systemic risk in some of the most important areas of the market, covering both supply and demand for energy. And these companies are in sectors that we believe are climate critical Action here would do a lot to help shift the global economy and markets in the right direction. Uh, I suppose I should say that our approach is twofold. There's a a quantitative basis where we assess companies in those areas against a range of climate metrics uh, to judge what progress they've made in these climate critical sectors. And this results in LGM's climate impact scores. We write to companies and those not meeting the minimum standards could be subject to vote sanction normally vote against the chair at the AGM. But the second part of of what we do is qualitative. It's a qualitative engagement approach, where in these climate critical sectors that we've identified, uh, we're looking for dial mover companies that we can talk to and encourage uh, in that transition, in the hope that they will also help be a catalyst for transition elsewhere in in those sectors. And we engage directly with them. We publish sector guides, which outline our expectations. And we have red lines, the kind of real minimum expectations we have of those companies we're talking to. And in broad terms, we want to see strategies that align towards net zero with sufficiently ambitious emissions targets. Together with that, we want to support the policy agenda. So one of our red lines that applies to every sector we look at is about climate lobbying. We want to see companies' lobbying activities aligned with that transition too. So it means we're being clear and public about what actions we need to take. We're engaging with over 100 dial mover companies over the past year. That involves the whole stewardship team. And uh, when we've been engaging with companies and they've not made sufficient progress, we might apply a vote sanction at an AGM. Ultimately, we might put the company on the divestment list for those funds where it's right to do so. Brilliant. That's great, Stephen. Thank you very much. So I know it's been running for a number of years now. How has the pledge evolved over time? And in particular, what have we done differently this year? Well, the pledge was launched in 2016 and in focusing, I think, on companies in one fund and it's expanded to cover over a thousand companies across 15 sectors we'd identified as important. Now it covers over 5,000 uh, across tw- companies across 20 sectors. That's kind of around about two thirds of the total emissions attributable to LGM's corporate holdings. We've increased our expectations uh, as well. We expect companies to be doing more to tackle climate change. You know, those dates, 2050 to achieve net zero, dates on the way, 2030 and other dates, they're not moving, but we're getting closer to them. So it's important that companies recognize this in practice. And that means through their actions, it's one reason why we emphasize climate lobbying, as I, as I mentioned, and why we've been focused on disclosure of corporate plans, but also the actions they take. Um, other areas that where we've made some changes has be, have been around um, biodiversity. We brought our concerns about biodiversity into the Climate Impact Pledge. That links with our ongoing engagement on deforestation. So nature and climate, we believe, are linked. Action on one affects the other. 
And we're also asking companies about their role in contributing to a just transition. That is a transition that has widespread support and is therefore sustainable, and which is vital. So those are the key changes, I think. Broadening scope, deepening the engagement, widening the range of companies we're assessing and increasing our expectations. That's great. Thank you. So, Anna, which sectors and regions are we seeing improving and which have been lagging more than others? So as Stephen mentioned earlier, under our quantitative engagement, we run companies using our own ratings. We call these the LGM Climate Impact Pledge Scores. And these are LGM's own scores and our own calculations. And to create these, we use third-party data from different sources, as well as internal climate data. We assess over 5,000 companies using our red, amber, green system. And these scores and rankings for each company are publicly available on our website. And in addition to our red, amber, green assessment on the website, we also generate a numerical score. And by looking at the average of this score across sectors and geographies, we can estimate and compare the general status of the sector or market. Looking specifically at how sectors are doing, insurance, banks, property, and oil and gas had the largest proportion of laggard companies. And these sectors also have a smaller percentage of companies with what we consider to be sufficiently ambitious emission reduction targets. At the other end of the spectrum, um, some of the new sectors that we've added this year include aluminium, glass, and forestry sectors. And these sectors had over 40% of companies uh, with ambitious emission reduction targets. So that would place them at the top of the 20 sectors that we cover. Um, we have to see more rapid improvements across geographies and sectors as we continue our engagements. That's great. I think that really gives us a sense of the vast scope of what we're doing here as well, which is really impressive and I think important um, from our clients' perspective. Christy, um, we hear a lot of discussion now and you know, within our teams generally, we understand the importance of biodiversity, deforestation, ensuring a, a just transition. These are all topics that are coming up every day with, with our clients. How do we capture those kind of related issues in what we're doing with the Climate Impact Pledge? Thanks, uh, Laura, for sure. Um, well, uh, since we launched the Climate Impact Pledge in 2016, our climate engagement has gone beyond uh, emissions mitigations, uh, taking a holistic approach through that climate kaleidoscope. We acknowledge that Simply, we cannot reach net zero without considering other related issues such as deforestation, waste and circularity, biodiversity, adaptation, climate resilience, and the just transitions. For instance, uh, LGM has been engaging with key companies on deforestation issues since 2016 as part of the pledge. And another example is that now we have data assessing companies' biodiversity programs uh, deforestation policy and programs, circularity and so on, um, within the climate impact page ratings. This shows how far and how fast uh, climate data is improving, although there's still uh, a long way to go. Um, in the second half of 2022, actually, we introduced uh, new expectations for companies which reflect the need for a just transition and the essential role of combating uh, biodiversity and nature loss in reaching net zero. We have integrated uh, these new expectations into the Climate Impact Pledge in two ways. Uh, first, we uh, specifically reference the importance of biodiversity and the just transition considerations across all sectors by raising awareness um, of the issue and its importance in the context of climate change. And secondly, uh, for investors with, where the link between biodiversity and net zero strategies are more obvious or where the transition could have a direct social impact implication, we now expect companies to assess uh, their impacts and dependencies on biodiversity to manage their risks, as well as mitigating and over time um, reversing negative impacts. And we also expect that companies' decarbonization strategies will address and incorporate uh, the impact of the just transition. We have also uh, bolstered our expectations in sectors where the net zero transition can be accelerated by, for instance, a, a circular economy approach or addressing deforestation and land conversion, 
or conducting a uh, water stress uh, testing. Uh, for example, uh, LGIM's expectations uh, for investing investee companies within uh, the apparel sector requires them to demonstrate how they are improving their circularity of materials. As fast fashion has become more popular and it is important for apparel companies to improve the way they source, use and dispose uh, these raw materials and deal with, with waste in a responsible way. Also, for example, in the food sector, if a company does, does not have a comprehensive deforestation and land conversion policy, we then, well, then it will fail our minimum expectations. So if companies continue to fail our minimum expectations over time, as Stephen mentioned, after a few years of engagement, they could be proposed uh, for divestment. That's really interesting. Um, thank you for that. So Stephen, on, on that sort of point about the fact that it, it is very challenging for, for some companies and sectors to, to get to net zero, um, as the pathway to one and a half degrees seems you know, very challenging. What are we doing to help our investee companies get there and achieve net zero? Oh, right. That's uh, as I mentioned, the those dates aren't changing, but we're getting closer to them. And um, I suppose I probably had a, a handful of, of points here. One is as a universal owner uh, with holdings across the global market, we can see how the sectors are interconnected. So our engagement reflects this. You know, climate critical sectors that we that we identify are from across value chains and we encourage companies to think about their place uh, in those value chains and the place of the emissions that they might be responsible for if you just thought very high level that companies use energy energy is generated uh, that uses energy supplies well there are a number of sectors that can get involved in that in that chain and we're thinking about greenhouse gases across the market, not just directly, you know, from a company's own operations and taking action on it. And we believe that you know, that engagement on climate policy is also important. We've mentioned climate lobbying. Um, to achieve all, to achieve net zero, all parts of the global economy need to take action. That policy agenda needs to shift. It needs to shift in the ne next COP, uh, COP, the COP28 that's coming up. National governments need to take more action. Regulators need to be aligned. Um, and we all have a part to play there in, in what we're saying and in uh, the engagements that we're having. And that's why we engage wherever it makes sense at the policy level and with companies for more action on, on climate. And I'd say, too, that that link between climate and nature that we're talking about so much this year uh, will become more important um, as time progresses. And I think that's something else that... Um, where we're adding some value there to companies in our engagement, we're joining the dots, and we're also sharing best practice uh, around the market from different sectors. Um, and then those conversations we've had with companies have been very fruitful for the most part. Uh, it's all about encouraging companies to change and having that dialogue, and we're trying to learn from them as well. So our emphasis is about making that change happen. How can we help? How can we reduce those systemic risks? Um, you know, with our broad scope, we're assessing thousands of companies. With our direct engagement, we're, we're moving that dial, we hope, with those companies, we're over 100 companies. And all of that's designed to help companies align their strategies and actions with a net zero world. So hopefully we are one part, but a, a, a very active part of that global effort um, on climate change. Thanks, Stephen. I just wanted to... Um, sum up really by by asking each one of our investment stewardship colleagues what they think would be a really good thing if we had to remember one thing and obviously that's going to be three in total because the three of them um, from the session what what would that be so Christy do you want to go first sure thanks Laura um, well I will leave you with the fact that our engagement goes beyond emissions mitigation, that we take a holistic approach and look at climate and nature interchangeably, while also integrating social implications. And that ultimately, we want to companies to align and come back to our funds. So we do not stop engaging until this happens. That's great. Anna. Yes, thank you. Just to recap what we said, um, it is very important that all economic actors use their influence positively and advocate for public policies that would support the delivery of an economy. 
um, within our direct engagement with over uh, over 100 companies, we have set a red line for uh, on the disclosure of climate lobbying activity. Um, so for our investee companies and for us as LGM to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, it will be critical that um, companies are not stalling regulatory development on climate transition and that they're using their influence to push policymakers to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Yeah, that's such an important and topical one, I think, the, the climate lobbying thing for everyone to remember that. And so finally, Stephen, what would you leave us with? I think I'd, re uh, Laura, I'd repeat my point about uh, the the news this year being the, the being. There's a lot of news about the climate impact pledge this year, but perhaps the, what I would focus on is that the broadening of the scope and the raising of the expectations, and that can give us some confidence that we're there on the in the forefront of engagement with companies on climate change. That's great. Thank you all. So we can be loud and proud about it being bigger and better than ever. Um, thank you to Christy, Anna and, and Stephen from the stewardship team and thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you very much. As a reminder, this podcast is intended for investment professionals only and shouldn't be shared with a non-professional audience. This podcast should not be taken as an invitation to deal in legal and general investments. Any views expressed during this recording belong to the individuals and are based on market conditions at the time of the recording and do not reflect the views of legal and general investment management. Forward-looking statements are by their nature subject to significant risks and uncertainties and are based on internal forecasts and assumptions and should not be relied upon. Where individual stocks are mentioned, these do not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any security and are for illustrative purposes only. Legal and General Investment Management Limited is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. For full terms and conditions, please visit our website. To find more content, you can check us out on Twitter, LinkedIn and our website. Copyright 2023. Legal and General Investment Management Limited. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, including photocopying and recording without the written permission of the publishers. This material is issued by Legal and General Investment Management Asia Limited, the Licence Corporation BBB 488, regulated by the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, for professional investors only. <laughs>